So today we are continuing our journey through uh, the last portion of Scripture in the book of John. John spends a vast majority of his book talking about this last 24 hours of Jesus' life. Now, I have um, been um, at deathbeds, and I have been um, when my father died. You know, I, he communicated the things that were important to him. He communicated the things that were him, like deep in his core that he wanted us to get. And Jesus knows that his time is up. You know, we talk about anxiety. Like, I couldn't imagine knowing for your life that this day's coming. And not only is it coming, but you're going to be alone in it. And so Jesus here is sitting with his closest friends, his closest followers, and he's sharing with them what is most dear and most important to his heart. You know, each of these chapters, and I'm sure Pastor Ron would agree with this as well, a lot of these chapters, we could spend eight weeks in one chapter. <laughs> and that's why we've encouraged you to please read along with us from John 13 to John 19 so that you can see the flow of what Jesus is trying to do and, and, and kind of culminates, if you will, in this high priestly prayer that he prays in John 17. And you can kind of see the themes that he's trying to weave together. And so just because we're preaching portions doesn't mean the other portions aren't important. They're very important, but you don't want to sit in here for 10 hours. You do? All right, well, Pastor Ron, grab a mic. We're just going to go, man. We'll tag team. So anyway, today I want to talk, we're going to talk today about love and hate. And you're saying, Shane, another love sermon? Look, don't blame me, blame Jesus. He's the one that keeps talking about it, right? And so today we're going to talk about love and we're going to talk about hate. And um, I want to say beforehand, there will be some kind of some strong things. And I don't want us to feel that as uh, rebukes or stings. I want us just to see that Jesus wants us to be better. Amen. Jesus just wants us to be better. And so this week was a very convicting week for me. As I was going through and pouring through, the Lord really showed me some things. And then he showed me, like, why maybe some things in my past didn't make sense. But it now does. All right? So today's going to be a great day. So love versus hate. So what is love? So I've got some popular things here that we could pull out and look at it. So the first, the next slide. Whoa, that's not the one I expected, but we'll read first and then go into it. This is my commandment. Love each of you in the same way that I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay one's life for one's friend. You are my friends. And if you do what I command, I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you're my friends. Now, I want to pause right there real quickly. Jesus wasn't running around calling people slaves. Okay? If you go back, remember all this is one big conversation. If you go back to John 13, remember he says slaves are not greater than their masters. Right? It, and so what he's saying here is he's kind of tagging into that. And saying, I don't call you slaves. I call you friends. And he gives the reason why. Now, you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. Now, some people want to park on that and say that this passage endorses a maybe a, a Reformed or a Calvinistic way of viewing Scripture. But I want you to notice here, they were chose to go what? Bear fruit. 
okay? God didn't look at them and go, heaven for you, hell for you, heaven for you, hell for you. He didn't do that, right? He's saying here he chose them to be productive, to go out into the world and spread the amazing good news. Amen? Aren't we thankful of that? If you're not, whew, anyway, I, I kind of got off on that. Um, so I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that your father will give you whatever you ask for. Man, there's so much we could preach on. Using my name. This is my command. Now, this is interesting because in previous verses, there was, um, if I can say it this way, in previous verses, he's talking about the, the vine and the branches. And he says to remain in me. And then he gives us the way to remain. He says, if you love me, obey my commandments. Right? What does he say in verse 17? This is my commandment right? Love each other. Now, we also know that Jesus also gave a caveat, love each other the way I do, right? Powerful stuff. If the world hates you, remember it hated me first. The world would not love you as one of its own. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it, but you're no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world so it hates you. Do you remember what I told you? A slave is not greater than the master. See the tie-in? The slave is not greater than the master. Since they persecuted me, naturally, they will persecute you. And if, you had listened, and if they had listened to me, they would listen to you. They will do all of this to you because of me, for they have rejected the one who sent me. They would not be guilty if I had not come and spoken to them, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Anyone who hates me also hates my father. If anyone had done such miraculous signs among them that no one else could do, they would not be guilty. But as it is, they have seen everything I did, yet they still hate me and my father. This fulfills what's written in scripture. They hated me without cause. So what is love? All right, what is love? Answer, love is the seventh sense that destroys all the other six senses and makes the person nonsense. <laughs> Dudes, we know this is true, right? Remember the first time you saw your wife? Dudes, you better participate big time. <laughs> your future depends on this. Remember the time you met your wife for the first time? Yes. Remember that? <laughs> yes. And you just kind of like, you know, when you go out to ask them to go out with you, I, I can still remember how nervous I was asking Lori to go out with me. I felt like I was a bumbling idiot. And out of sheer mercy and kindness and compassion, she said yes and She's been stuck with me ever since. <laughs> Let's look at another one. I love this one. Remember the Hathaway song from 1993? What is love? Don't hurt me. Come on, say it with me, baby. Don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. No more. There you go. Now, that song really wasn't a big song unless you watch Saturday Night Live. And then the... That type of deal, right? And so... Evidently, to him, love is just don't hurt me. But we all know that that is impossible, right? Except for Miss Monica. She's like on another level of love. It's just amazing, right? Miss Monica's going to kill me after this. So anyway, uh, yes. So love, you know, this is his definition. But I would like to take today, I would like to take these words, lo the love words, and I'm going to break them down in the Greek. And we're going to look at what these words mean. Because see, a lot of times in scripture and translation, and the reason why it's so difficult is because there's not an exact uh, English word for a Greek word or a Hebrew word. We have to understand their language was about concepts 
and, and word pictures. And so when we read our English translation, we, we see love, 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 but actually if you heard it in the native tongue, it would be three or four different words that communicate three or four different languages. Now, here's what I encourage you to do. I have two Bibles that I regularly go to. I've got a New American Standard. It's the most accurate word-for-word -word translation that there is. And then I use the New Living Translation. Both of them translate a little different. New Living Translation is thought for thought. Because word for word, you can read it, but not always get it. Just like this. Like, can you imagine in history, uh, I mean, our history when they're looking back on us, and they're going to go, why was their car sick? <laughs> because sick usually means like, right? Like, sick. But we say our cars are sick. Or man, that is so cool. Well, what about that new phone is cold? Are, are, are you with me? And so sometimes there's got to be context given in. So I personally encourage you. I know Pastor Ron does this as well. He uses a lot of translations. I do the same. But those are kind of my two go-to. When I'm looking for Greek exactness, I go to New American Standard. If I'm looking for the thought, I go to New Living Translation. That was all free. You don't have to pay for that. <laughs> so today what I want to do is actually break down some of these words for us. And I want you to see the power behind the concepts that God is trying to bring forward. So the next side, please. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I've loved you. There's no greater love than to lay one's life down or lay down one's life for a friend. Verse 17. This is my commandment. What? Love each other. And I want you to look here at verse 19. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it, but you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world. Now, in, in, I'm just going to pull out three of them, but there's three main Greek words at play here. And I want us to see the significance. In verses 12 and verse 17, those words there, can, can you see it with me? Yeah. I, I can't because of the light. So agapo, this is the verb of agape, right? So agape, we talk a lot about kind of being unconditional love. Agapo, say it with me. Agapo, agapo is actually that love in action. And so what it says here. The Greek in agapo means to love, that is a direction of will. It's love that expresses itself in compassion. So love, oftentimes when I talk about love, it's a choice. If you lived in my house, you would understand my wife makes this choice daily, right? It's a choice, but it's not just choosing to love. It's a love that is actually directed toward action. And its main characteristics is compassion or benevolence. It's, it's, it's a love that motivates me so deeply that I have to do something towards the object or the person that I'm loving. Very, very deep word. Do you see that? The next one in verse 13 obviously is the word that we're most used to, and that is agape, which can also be translated as charity. Very, very powerful. Now this, is, this love, um, now this is a love that doesn't mean um, doing what the person you love wants, but rather what's best for them. Let me say that again. This is a love that does what's best for you, not what the person wants. Now, most of us in here have had the blessing of having children right? And it's, it's a blessing that keeps on giving. <laughs> now, your children, if, 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 like, if they have a choice between chocolate and eggs, which one are they going for? Right. Or if the choice is between a salad And a candy bar, what are they going to choose? 
candy bar. But we know that could be really, really bad for them, right? Especially done too much. And so what happens is as parents, we practice this same form of love. We're giving to them, it's charity, but we're also saying, look, I love you so much that you are not eating chocolate and the candy bar today. Now, they have a reaction to that, right? That's usually not very pleasant. But the truth is, is we're loving them because they don't understand. And there's a lot of times my brothers and my sisters in a loving relationship with Jesus, there's things that happen and they're not what we want to happen. It's just not. Can we all be honest about that? If we were to write our stories, it would be very different. But it would also be very self-centered and very selfish and very ego-driven. So God loves us in a way that is best for us. This is very, very powerful words. Are you sensing the power of these words? And so when they were listening to this in their native tongue, they were able to distinguish Wow, there's a lot of deep meaning here. But I want us to look at verse 19. Remember where it says the world loves, right? Verse 19, the Greek word for here is phileo, which most of the time we call brotherly love. Doesn't sound bad, does it? But if you peel back the layers a little bit, it actually means that it's love because of shared interest. Love because of shared interest. The world only loves you because you share a common interest with the world. But the moment you step into relationship with Jesus, the world's interest and your interest are radically different. And they are going to lead to two very different different places in life. And so because we don't have this shared interest with the world, they turn around and they hate us. They hated Jesus. Do you realize Jesus' whole life would have been different if he would have just sided one way or the other? If he would have went with the Romans or with the Jews? It would have been so much easier for him. But because he didn't, they what? Crucified him. Right here. I mean, imagine that much hate. That much hate because they don't, he didn't check off their box list of agreed philosophies and understandings. And so they crucified him. But my brothers and my sisters, I was hugely convicted this week. Because unfortunately, churches are practicing more phileo than they are agape and agapo. We tend to only love people that check off our boxes. We only tend to love people when we share the same interest. In churches for a long time, our history is riddled not only with beauty, but tragedy. Because there's times where we've loved beautifully like Jesus, and there's times where we haven't. My brothers and my sisters, we live in a system in this world that only loves people if it agrees with it. We can actually see it played out, can't we? I mean, you don't have to watch media, social media, TV, God forbid, news, any of that stuff. It only takes a second to see what I'm talking about in action. It's not agape, it's not agapo, it's phileo. It's conditioned love. And as long as you agree with me, we are in relationship, but the moment you disagree, we're out of relationship. And sadly, when you talk to lost people, and I have a lot of lost friends, I have a lot of people who have not yet decided to walk with Jesus. 
And this is one of their major critiques. And we practice this. That's why I'm so thankful for what Pastor Ron and Miss Monica did 20-something years ago. They started a church that said no more. We're not going to love like that. We are going to love unconditionally. We are going to love everyone. So what does that mean, church? That means we need to throw our checklist out the window. If you're single, we love you. If you're married, we love you. If you're divorced, we love you. If you're remarried, we love you. If you're straight, we love you. If you're gay, we love you. If you're a lesbian, we love you. If you're trans, we love you. If you're in a place where you don't know really where you are, we still love you. My brothers and my sisters, that is the story of Jesus. That is the story. Yes, thank you. Yay, Jesus. And so let us not walk in a love that is conditional and only around, it's only connected if we share the same interest. When I grew up, I grew up super lonely. I, I really didn't fit in anywhere at all. And one of my problems is, was as a kid as I was a deep thinker. I, I just liked to take and, and look at things and think about things differently. I was raised in a man's world where men weren't supposed to be sensitive. Men didn't cry. But I was sensitive. And I cried a lot till I lost my capacity to cry because it didn't matter. I grew up in a cultish environment where the only way God loves you is if you fill out these certain aspects. And I'm talking crazy things like saying a man has to look like a man. So two finger spaces above your eyebrows, your hair has to be off your ears and off the back of your collar. I got no problem with that now. <laughs> Where women could not wear pants because that was a sin. Where misogyny reigned. You weren't even allowed to speak if you were a woman. You could only do so with children. Like it was a very hateful environment. And then the Christian school that I went to because I didn't go to their church I wasn't loved. And I couldn't make sense of it. I, st I struggled with this my entire adult life. And then this week, the Lord showed me that shame is not actually love. It's not actually love. And then the heart wrench comes in, and then I realize that I wasn't loving the way that God wanted me to love because people weren't checking off my boxes. And so Jesus and I had a long conversation this week, just like I think some of you will have. And it's okay. Why? Because Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. So let us be people of love. Let's look at hate. Hate. There was this really bad band in the 90s called Ugly Kid Joe. How many of you know them? They really had one hit called Everything I Hate About You. And I get sick when I'm around. I just dread to be around. I hate everything about you. That's a pretty good definition. It's a pretty good definition. Let's go to the next one. So I want us to read these few verses together. If the world hates you, 
remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as one of their own if you belong to it, but you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world so it hates you. Anyone who hates me also hates my father. This fulfills what is written in the scriptures. They hated me without cause. Now, in verse 18 and 19, there's a word here that I want us to look at and what this meaning of the word is. And so I want to say it before. Have you ever been around people from like the north, like Michigan or Canada before? Yeah, anybody? It's okay. You can raise your hands and be proud of it. It's okay. I lived in Canada for 15 years. And one of the things that stuck with me and I still can't get rid of is A. How you doing, eh? Going to the store, eh? How many of you heard that before? It is a true and real thing that my family still makes fun of me for. So this first word, you ask why I brought that up. I'm going to teach you how to pronounce this. It's mis a -E. Say it with me. Miss a e There you go. And this Greek word means that it has, it starts in the present and it will continue into the future. And so this is something that we as Jesus followers have to understand. The moment that we step into Jesus's love, the moment we decide to follow him with our lives, the world starts hating you and it will not stop hating you. Did you see that? And sometimes I think we forget that. Sometimes I think we forget that the world hates us. And, and when I say world, I'm not talking people, I'm talking systems. I'm talking motivations behind the systems. Because if you look at it, those systems are meat grinders, are they not? Are they not? It is very difficult. And so these systems, the spiritual forces at work, and unfortunately comes through people because they're aligned with those systems, there's a hate that happens and it doesn't stop. The next, um, the next one in verse 23 um, is actually the word that the first one comes from. And so I'm gonna teach us how to pr pronounce this one. Miss Aon, Miss Aon, say it with me. Right, and I know Pastor Ron's laughing at me right now, but I'm Southern, dude. It's just, I'm a Southern dude trying to speak Greek. So anyway, the, this, this word hate, it, it means it's, a, it's a, a continuous, repeated action. It, it's, it's not just the hate of sitting in a room with someone that you know really doesn't like you, but it's a hate in action. We've seen this in history, the martyrs, right? In our current history, we have places in the world where Christians have not seen the light of day in years. We have places in the world where to become a Jesus follower is a death sentence and at very best, a total rejection of everyone who loves you, supposedly. So this is a hate in action. In verse 25, this next word I'm gonna teach us how to pronounce. Hate is the Greek word, because I have no, I'm just playing. That's not how you pronounce it. Man, you guys, are you tracking with me today? Have I put you to sleep? So we're just all gonna pronounce it together. What are you gonna do? There we go. All right. At least three of you are awake. All right. And this is very important. This is not a hate that's commanded. It's a hate chosen. Very, very powerful things that Jesus is communicating here. He's trying to show us the depth of love that is found in him. And he's trying to show us the depth of hate that takes place when you do follow him. And they didn't get it. 
but in about, what do you think, Pastor Ron, 10 hours? They're going to understand it fully. What Jesus is talking about with hate. Do you know that Peter had to watch his wife crucified before him? And then they crucified him upside down? Hate. Hate is an ugly, link, ugly thing. So we as believers should not have any of that in our DNA at all. At all. And so I know it's, it's hard. It's a hard struggle sometimes to love people that are different from us. But can we just admit that it's a struggle and not let it go to hate? And not pray that man, like Jesus, like help me love like this. And you said, Shane, is it even possible to love like Jesus? Well, Paul thought so. He wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 13, talking about how love is patient and it's kind and it's not self-serving and it doesn't hold records of wrongs and et cetera. It's like, it's powerful. And you say, hey, Shane, how is it power? How can that happen? The Holy Spirit is in us. And so I often pray to the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, let me love people like you do, but help me love you the way that you love Jesus. And Jesus, the way you love the Father. And God, how you love the Holy Spirit. Help me love like that because it is possible. I know we're human and I know we're going to mess up, but the mess up should be the anomaly, not the normal. Are you with me? Amen. So there's some things that I want us to consider. This is a strong phrase. Hate never beats hate. Let me say it again. Hate never, ever, ever beats hate. You cannot beat hate with hate. And Lord knows we have a history of trying. Don't we? I'll show you a really easy example of this. Back when I was living in Canada, one of these horrible things came to light. Um, there was a 15-year-old Iranian kid who had killed a um, um, kind of an army medic. And when you hear his story, he was taught that hate by his parents. Do you know what they did with that 15-year-old? They put him in Guantanamo Bay at 15 years of age. But if you slide down a little bit and go into Africa, when those kids, those child soldiers are out there and they're doing these horrible things because they have to in order to live and their families to live, we want to rehabilitate them, which is what we should want. Amen? Two different terms about same children. Do you see how hate divides? Hate never beats hate. Hate aligns up with Satan's agenda. And Satan's agenda is very clear and simple. Jesus tells us it's in the red letters. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's all he does. That's it. Satan's sole existence on this planet is to break the heart of God. How does he break the heart of God? By killing and destroying and stealing from God's most loved objects, us. That's all he does. We need to be aware of that. We need to be aware of our own motives. And as we're out in our business places and our lives out away from this place, wherever you go, whatever space and place you go to, make sure that you're not allowing hate to contaminate your heart. 
as the second point, as a church and Jesus followers, we cannot love the way the world does. We cannot. When we only love people who align with our interests, we become, we become and embrace, a very strong phrase here, the spirit of antichrist. Now, what do I mean by that? If Christ is love, right? If we operate outside of that love, it's antichrist. I'm not talking about the person. I'm talking about the spirit. And I said that strongly so that all of us would realize we can't stay neutral. You pick a side. One of them is Jesus. The other is Antichrist. You're actually working against the ways of Jesus. And so let us, me included, not love the way the world does. Because my brothers and my sisters... Some of the categories of individuals that I've mentioned to you today, can you imagine how they feel every single day being mocked, made fun of, hated, told their accidents, told their crazy? Are, are you with me? Every single day, we have to be the voice of love by the spirit who works within us. And lastly, we also have a history that shows and proves that when we love like Jesus, it's world changing. When we love like Jesus, it's world changing. Why? Because love always wins. It always wins. Love always wins. Say it with me. Love always wins. So I don't know about you, but I like being a winner. So I want to be a person of love. I learned something, as many of you know, I actually call Pastor Ron my pastor. He's one of my closest friends, he's a mentor. I love our conversations. He actually said something to me one time that he didn't know this, but it took me a several months to work it through in my head. But you have this phrase about being an enemy. Can you just say that out loud? about not being, yeah. No yep, no enemies allowed. He will not allow people to make him their enemy. He's gonna to continue to love, serve, walk with, care for, pour out for. He will not be allowed, he will not allow them to make them an enemy. That's how love wins. That's how love wins. Amen? So this week, let us go out and be agents of love. I want you to do something radical this week. I want you to love the person that drives you insane, that they don't check the boxes, and there's a bit of animosity growing in you. I want you to do some crazy loving. We're in California, hippie, you know, crazy loving, right? We want to do some crazy loving this week. And then when you come back next week, I want you to write your experience on the card. I want you to tell me about their facial expressions when you bought them lunch. Or you let them go first. Or you retrieve papers out of the copier for them. Are you, are you following me? crazy acts of love. And then next week when you come back, I want you to write them down. Amen. And man, I have went way over time today. Wow. Darby just kicked me. Sorry guys. Next gen is going to kill me. Let's pray. Father, whew, forgive me for not keeping my time commitment. But father, I pray that as we leave today, that we would contemplate these deep meanings and deep messages, that we would be agents, agents of love. In your name I pray, amen.